Hey guys, it's Teddy and welcome to season two of my hypothetical Winx Club reboot. Today we will be redesigning Diaspro and boy did I not like what they did with her character. So this one's gonna get interesting. Now she is a character that would show up in season one with the whole being Sky's fiance thing. But by the end, I think you'll understand why I put her in season two of the designs. Diaspora is one of the only other girls we meet that is the same age as Bloom. They're both 16 when the story starts. All the way back in Bloom's video, I mentioned that she actually started at Alfia a year earlier than is normal so that she could begin her training as soon as possible. And during the first season, she's also doing human school alongside her magical studies. But yeah, this is why Diaspora doesn't attend Alfia yet. She's going next year. She's not really thinking about it too much since she knows there's pretty much no way she won't get in. And in the meantime, she's focusing more on training to one day become queen of Arachleon, like her parents promised she would be. Diaspora is from a very wealthy family in the south of Arachleon. Her family has several businesses, but makes most of their money as the owners of a massive jewelry brand that has decorated royalty for generations. I want Diaspora's mom to be a fairy as well, but like fairy of something lame. So she didn't really feel like pursuing and practicing her magic was worth it. I mean, she had an arranged marriage to a wealthy man, so why bother trying to make a name for herself? And I mean, it worked out for her, so why wouldn't it work out for Diaspora? It's not like her fiance is going to publicly reject her in a grand display of love for someone else entirely. That would be crazy. Except no, that is exactly what happens. In preparation for the wedding, Diaspora's family moves up north to the capital, where she hates it and has no idea how to dress for the weather. It is around this time that Sky's parents finally reveal the arrangement that they have made for him. I talked about this in Sky's video, but yeah, he is horrified at the news and ends up feeling like his whole life is being ripped away from him, leading to the first time he really rebels against his parents. But as strict and expectant as they are of him, the king and queen do love their son. Diaspora's are a different story. They had one goal for her in life and she failed at it. And now to them, she is nothing but a disappointment. She may seem spoiled, but the truth is it never was for her. It was all for her parents. Despite being 16, Diaspora wears a lot of makeup and is never seen without her iconic blowout, making her hair silky and voluminous. So she sort of looks older than she is. She is very serious about making sure she is always presenting herself in the exact way she wants to be seen. Slim, but not too thin, skin looking as flawless as possible from head to toe, and her signature golden smoky eye and scarlet lip adorning her unwavering pout. In the original show, there are three white girls that all have the same long blonde hair and gold eyes, which is kind of weird to me since there's so much room to play with character designs in this world, even if everyone does have the same body type. Yeah, that doesn't help. <laughs> I gave Stella more melanin and made her taller and made Daphne a bit chubbier with copper hair, but Diaspora's look is still pretty similar. I did go for an old Hollywood glam kind of vibe as well. After the rejection, Diaspora is pissed. She worked her whole life to be Skye's bride and she can't fathom why he would possibly reject her. She's perfect. And the truth is she like actually liked him for a lot of the same reasons Bloom did, or does. He's tall, handsome, the prince, and he exudes an air of intelligence and gentlemanly charisma that left her practically swooning. If Bloom hadn't come to Althea when she did, maybe the two of them actually could have ended up as a couple, Diaspro and Sky, both hiding behind the mask of prestige they had created until they either cracked or absorbed it completely. But it didn't end up that way, and Sky gets a chance to try for true happiness with someone he loves. At an Arachleonite Nobles event following the exhibition at Red Fountain that happens in season one of this rewrite, Diaspro confronts Skye outside the party, really tearing into him and letting herself be angry for the first time in who knows how long. Skye reluctantly tries to comfort her, but stands firm on his choice and ends up leaving her there, only for another attendee to overhear and decide to provide some comfort of her own, and maybe even a proposition. Icy knows what it's like to be smothered by a Raclianite high society, and she knows what it looks like when someone starts to break. 
Diaspora has just become the perfect target to use as a pawn in their plan. Icy pretends to befriend Dia, mimicking the way she sees Darcy and Stormy act at parties, and eventually she introduces her to Darkar himself, who offers to soothe her worries in exchange for some information. It's at this point she becomes a spy for Darkar, since Riven has already made his loyalties clear and sort of been ostracized from the group. So her job becomes getting him information on Bloom and her friends. She's the one who tells them about her attachment to Avalon. Then, when they have what they need, Diaspora is the first to be locked away in the dungeons below Cloud Tower by the Trix. All alone in a cold, dusty prison cell, Diaspora has plenty of time to think about her actions. Her whole life has been ruined beyond comprehension, and as much as she wants to blame Bloom and Sky, the truth is it's herself that she's most angry at. She spends days wallowing in self-hatred and fear and regret, and then she gets a neighbor. The tricks have taken over the school and thrown Griffin in the dungeons as well, and a few days later, another prisoner joins them. Riven reports what he's seen up above, and how bad things are getting, and how hard the others are fighting against it all. Griffin explains how she was ambushed in her office, and now all she wants to do is get out of there and protect the innocent students she was supposed to lead. How she feels so guilty that she didn't see the evil living right under her nose. Riven then tells them about how he had been foolish enough to trust Darcy, and really thought the two of them had something special. But when he found out who they were working for, he tried to dump her then and there, so Icy and Stormy threw him in a cell. But he didn't plan on staying there long. Suddenly, Diaspora burst into tears and confessed what she had done to end up down there herself. She had worked directly beside the monster that they spoke of. She helped them get the upper hand. How could she ever show her face again? This pissed Riven off. He manages to pick the locks and open their cells, and he beckons for her to join them in the fight. But Diaspora refuses. Not only is she ashamed of what she's done, but she knows that she'll get ripped to shreds out there, to which Riven shouts back that she's a coward. They made their mistakes, doesn't mean they can't be there when they're needed most. If anything, they owe it to the people they hurt. He knows how she feels more than anyone, and that's why he needs to get his ass out there and fight. He reaches his hand out to help her up, but she doesn't take it. So he simply scoffs and leaves for the battlefield. She may not have gone with him, but Riven's words didn't leave her mind for a long time. The first time we meet Diaspora, she's at the Red Fountain exhibition for the Day of the Royals. She always dresses glamorously, but on this occasion, she has taken special care to look her best, since she'll be meeting her new fiancé for the first time. She's covered in her favorite stone, Amber, for good luck wearing an intricate necklace of interlocking gold chains leading to amber pendants, as well as having one on her belt and one on each anklet. Her dress is form-fitting, meant to be seductive yet elegant, and her white gloves and shoes are a symbol of her belief that she is better than the world around her. The colors are largely the same as her original design, just swapped in like ratio, I guess. And I still want to keep the general idea of her dress as being something that a princess would wear, with like puff sleeves and accessories and stuff, just a little more, I don't know, not toned down, but like, you know what I mean, since she's not actually a princess in this rewrite. Just like, yeah, more simple? I don't know. Anyways, in this rewrite, Diaspora is Fairy of Gemstones. She's an embodiment fairy, so there's no particular object or place she's connected to, just the concept of gemstones, really. To some it might seem lame, especially when compared to guarding the dragon's flame or drawing power from the light of the literal sun, but you know who doesn't think it's lame? Her parents, who were ecstatic when it turned out their daughter was not only a fairy, something highly desirable for their image, but also a fairy that could locate and identify gemstones for them. Because of the way that her powers connect her to the planet, she can basically sense where the large pockets of ore and crystal are located underground, which is very beneficial for Max maximizing profits. It sucks that her powers ended up being just another way her parents control her, but at least she enjoys gemology quite a bit. Diaspora is named after a gemstone, Jasper, but her favorite gem is actually amber. It's a stone that comes from something that was once living, and she thinks that's really cool. Nobody ever asks, though. 
Dia is pretty good with her powers when it comes to stuff like that. She isn't enrolled in Elfia at the moment since she's actually a year too young and certainly wasn't planning on starting school a year early when she barely even thinks she'll need it. She does have a personal tutor, so she has a basic grasp on her magic, but the truth is she's not very good at fairy things. She isn't great at casting spells or flying, and honestly just doesn't have the kind of passion for it that the Winks seem to have. To her, being a fairy is just like being from Heraklion. It's true for her, and she would rather it be that way, but it's not a lifestyle or something she feels she needs to like get better at. She doesn't even care about her enchantics. This means that after her very public rejection and being used as a pawn for evil, after her future seemingly crumbled before her eyes, she had no idea what she was going to do. She always thought she would end up queen and never considered any other possibilities, leading to a bit of an identity crisis. We see Diaspora again in season 2, when the next school year starts, but she isn't at Alfia. Instead, she will be attending Red Fountain. Of course, right off the bat, everyone thinks this is some kind of ploy to spend time with Sky and, like, seduce him into abandoning Bloom and falling for her so she can become queen. Even after explaining that, no, she really is there to work hard and become a great specialist, no one seems to believe her. They don't know about what she went through in season one, just that she was a stuck-up jerk that was always harassing Skye. Then, one person defends her decision to enroll. Riven. This leads to some turmoil within the group as it brings up old wounds from season one that everyone has been trying to move past. He doesn't even go out of his way to befriend her, really. I mean, she is an Heraclionite noblewoman. But still, he argues with his teammates that she regrets her actions just as much as he does, and they forgave him for something far worse. It takes a while for everyone else to come around to the idea of her being a specialist, but it definitely helped that her closest teammate was so quick to vouch for her after only a few weeks of training together, especially considering his reputation as a kind-hearted and respected individual video is next. I struggled so much with her fairy design, I really wanted to give her a corset top like in her original fairy form, but it was so hard to come up with the right styling for it. There were some skirt designs I tried that I really liked, but I just couldn't use because this is a magic winks form for a fairy who isn't in fairy school, so it really shouldn't be especially complex. Yes, Diaspora would absolutely care about how she looks in this form and want to be fashionable, but she also doesn't care a whole lot about being a fairy, so is she really gonna work super hard on manifesting her fairy form? I decided on trying to go for an outfit that felt like it could just be something from her closet that she would like normally wear, so I gave her a skirt inspired by the skirt on her original dress, even though I'm not really a big fan of the high-low style. She probably could have more gemstones, I only really gave her her lucky amber, so so let's say that her bracelets are pure ruby as well to match her ruby boots. Oh, and I changed her wings. There's a certain style I'm going for in my rewrite when it comes to wings, I've talked about it before. Like yes, every pair is different, they're all unique to the person that is sporting them, but I want them to be very clearly derivative of the same original pair of wings, that pair being the mother dragons. And Diaspora's spiky black and red wings didn't really align with that idea, so instead I tried to mimic the shape and lighten them to match her hair. They aren't super flashy or big, and I think that works for what I want for her as well. Dia will be around in the beginning of season 2 as a prominent specialist, with her team often being paired alongside Skies because of their skill level. Of course, her team does have the grandson of the headmaster of Red Fountain, so not only do they have a very talented and well-trained captain, but they also inevitably get special treatment because Saladin is a sentimental man. Diaspora did have to apply an audition to get into the school like anyone would, but it can't be denied that her status was a major factor in her acceptance, and she knows this. While she is being looked down on by other specialists and mocked by other fairies, being met with distrust by the people she wants to prove herself to most of all, she continues to carry the guilt of her secrets. Eventually, we would learn from a heartfelt moment with Skye just how much all of this means to her. She would confess it all to him, not looking to gain sympathy or spark a romance, but for forgiveness from a friend. Sky would react in anger, shocked that she could have stooped so low and begin to storm away, but she would take his hand and plead. During the battle with Darkar, she had felt fear, isolation, and helplessness the likes of which she had never known. She had been angry and naive and used, and still after everything she had done, 
Suddenly, Riven had offered her a chance at redemption, but she was too scared to take it. She never wants to feel that way again. Plus, now she can get a chance to do some good via the specialist outreach program. She knows she isn't perfect. She's definitely been humbled pretty severely, but she wants to work to be better in a way that matters, not just in the way that her parents want. Sky sees the way her experience has changed her and kind of relates and he wants to forgive. But first, he insists that she must come clean to the rest of the group. She agrees. With the Winks and specialists gathered around, Diaspora comes clean in a heartfelt speech. Everyone begins to talk, asking questions she tries desperately to answer or commenting on their interpretation of her words. Except for Bloom. Sky steps forward and stops the commotion, asking her what she thinks. The whole room looks to her as she gets up and approaches Diaspro, who tries to apologize again, but Bloom pulls her into a hug. I know what it's like to feel used like that, she says. And Dia just cries. After this, everyone kind of lays off and starts to accept her being a better person. She makes some genuine friendships, even getting pretty close with Flora, and at school events, she can be seen mingling with the Winks and their friends. Then, when the gang goes to Earth, she won't be going along, despite one of her teammates being added to the mission. Instead, she and the other two members of her group are tasked with monitoring their progress and well-being from back at Red Fountain. This means we would see a lot less of her throughout the second half of Season 2, besides virtual check-ins, until our main group comes back from the catastrophe that concludes their time on Earth. Diaspora wears the same specialist uniform as everyone else at the school, despite her protests with admin. She insists that blue is not her color, so she accessorizes with her signature shade of scarlet. Her boots are still designer, of course, however they're made for combat rather than just style. So much sturdier than her usual heels. Yeah, she means business. Can't you tell by her ponytail? She also has a harness belt in the same red color she loves, with gold hardware, of course, she's a gold girly. The belt is to accentuate her waist and to carry her weapon. Since Diaspora's light pin is the same scarlet, that means that her Fanto blade will be that color as well. A little reminder about that. Specialist light pins are given by the school as part of their uniform. The pins have trackers for the students and can also ping the location of their weapon. The pin can be worn anywhere on the person, but must be visible. The colors are meant to aid in identifying the specialist wearing the pin from a distance, especially in situations during which their flashlight function may be used, like if they were under rubble or lost or something. For her weapon, Dia was assigned a two-handed battle axe. The axe has the same extending capabilities as Brandon's spear, making it easier for her to wear on her back as a short club. It is still a heavy weapon that requires more effort to wield effectively, meaning she would need to swing with confidence and practice her aim. She is here because she is done being a damsel in distress. She's ready to fuck shit up, thank you very much. The blade is designed after felling axes, the ones used to chop down trees. I like that it's a type of axe meant for labor, as well as tying into her favorite gem being fossilized tree sap. There's definitely some kind of symbolism there, but I'm not totally sure what it is. Her axe also has a pick on one side of it as a nod to her fairy title. She's fairy of gemstones, and they can be mined with picks. It's supposed to represent her stepping up to do things for herself honestly, rather than exploiting others for her own gain, as well as her taking her powers back for herself instead of them just being a money-making opportunity for her parents. She's taken life by the reins with both hands. Diaspro had spent her life being groomed for the throne. Her parents expected nothing less from her after spending all of that money on private tutors, etiquette lessons, fine clothes and jewelry, and anything else she would need to uphold their image of perfection they've crafted in the public eye. Alongside everything they've provided her though, they have also instilled less positive messages. Diaspora was expected to never talk back, never question what she had been told, and to never deviate from her perfect persona. Yeah, she was basically not ever allowed to develop a personality of her own. But who needs one of those when you've got adoring fans? She was a celebrity, but unlike Icy, she isn't the brave, resilient young girl who overcame tragedy to be a powerful magic user, and unlike Stella, she isn't a princess known for her delightful rapport with her subjects and passion for creating her own clothing brand one day. I think Diaspora was just one of those people who's famous because she's famous. She didn't really do anything besides look pretty and have money. I mean, she's probably tried acting and maybe even singing or modeling or stuff like that. 
but I don't think she was, uh, very good at them. Her real time to shine will come in Season 3. In the original, Season 3 Diaspro crosses a line with that love potion nonsense. Like, that shit is way too far. At that point of the show, she's 20 years old, so she's not a kid anymore. And that makes for an interesting question of whether or not she deserves to have a chance at ever being friends with our cast again. Initially, she is banished, only to later return in Season 5 when they have her, like, pretending to be redeemed or something. I don't know much about all that other than she's voiced by Ariana Grande. And they gave her a sick ass outfit change. Like, look at those shoulder spikes! But I, I did really like the idea of her becoming a fighter in her own right. Maybe ending up a knight one day. And that's how we got here. When the Prince of Darkness himself returns in season 3 of this rewrite, he will offer her that love potion. And after some suspenseful contemplation, she will accept the bottle. Then, as soon as he magics his pretty little tush away, she takes that nonsense to the Winx immediately and tells them everything. They spend the night coming up with a plan for what to do next, and in the morning they take it to Farragonda. Half the girls think it's a great shot at getting the upper hand, but the other half still think it's a suicide mission. Diaspro herself believes she owes it to them and the world to do this. She's going to give the potion back to Valtor, having decided she no longer wants Sky's love. She wants to take him and the Winx down. At least that's what she'll tell him. It'll be dangerous. Valtor has killed before, which Bloom knows all too well. And despite their differences in the past, she doesn't want Diaspro to lose her life. Still, having someone on the inside could be a great advantage. And Farragonda knows the Winx well enough at this point that she expects this plan will play out with or without permission. So she reluctantly gives her blessing. But she insists they must talk it over with Saladin as well, since he is Diaspro's headmaster. He also reluctantly agrees. Though for this mission, she will be effectively dropping out of Red Fountain to serve as a member of Valtor's forces. From then on, Diaspro acts as a spy for the Winx. She only just barely has the trust of her enemies, and the stakes are higher than they have ever been. But she is determined to carry out this mission. She's a warrior now, and she won't back down from this fight. Normally, I only do three outfits for these redesigns, but I couldn't resist drawing her in armor, and I seriously love it for her. Ugh. I guess it does make sense that Diaspro would totally be the first one to get a fourth design since she's just so extra. Anyways, I did give her another hairstyle since I thought the Barbie ponytail worked for her school uniform look, but once she becomes a double agent warrior for the Prince of Darkness, I felt like she would need something a little more refined and less cutesy. Still has to be cute though, of course, let's not get crazy. She may be wearing all silver now, a big change for her, but she still got her red accessories. I think that collar thing is called a neck cowl, but if I'm wrong, please let me know. The red fabric tied around her waist is meant to evoke the red dress we first met her in and serve as a reminder to herself of how much she's changed. She's also got red gloves, a callback to the original white gloves she wore with that dress, now the color of blood after everything she's gone through but also the color of her true self, of her heart. Instead of being a way to shield her hands from the filth of the common people she saw as so beneath her, now she wears her gloves to hold tight to her weapon as she fights for those same people. Oh, okay, yeah, her weapon. I have been so excited for this. She still fights with an axe like she did at Red Fountain, but since she no longer has access to her Phanto Blade, she instead uses her magic as Fairy of Gemstones to create her weapon. I imagine she could change the blade to be any type of stone she desired, but for the purpose of this redesign, that is a blade of obsidian. Technically considered a gemstone, obsidian is actually volcanic glass that can be fashioned into blades sharper than those of steel. Sometimes it's even used for surgical scalpels. So this axe of hers is actually terrifying to me. And you may have noticed it's a familiar shape. Because of her apparent new allegiance, the blade of her axe is similar in shape to the Mark of Valtor. There are other simple V-shapes incorporated into her outfit, including on her helmet, which also sports metal bars across her eyes, since she's the only one there who really knows how much of a prisoner she is. But don't worry, she's still got her amber for good luck. Oh my god, this video is so long. <laughs> But I just had so much to talk about with her. The transformation she goes through during this story is crazy and I wanted to hit every aspect of it. She's just so fun. My version of Diaspro isn't a villain. She's a teenage girl who was manipulated from the moment she was born. 
She had to hit rock bottom before she could see through it. But once she does, she works to fix her mistakes and find her true self. And she does all of it while being show-stoppingly gorgeous. Let me know what you think about her new story in the comments. I really enjoyed going ham on this one. Okay, I'll see you then. Bye!